This is Dusty Jones here to talk with you about prime numbers. Uh, if we could take a natural number that's greater than 1, uh, we say that that number is prime if and only if the only factors of n are 1 and n. And we say n is composite if and only if uh, n has more than two different factors. The number 1 is neither prime nor composite. It's referred to as a unit. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic, uh, or FTA, states that every natural number greater than 1 is either prime or, if it's not prime, it can be written as the product of primes in only one way, except for the order of the primes. And because of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, each number has a different fingerprint, so to speak, found in the primes in its factorization. No two numbers are alike uh, in, in their prime factorizations. In action, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says 19 is prime. 18 is not prime, but it can be written as the product of 1, 2, and 2, 3's in any order. 17 is prime. 16 is not prime, uh, but it can be written as the product of 4 2's. And not only this, but if you have four twos, the only number that you can get is 16 when you multiply those prime numbers together. Same thing if you have two threes and a two. The only number you're going to get when you multiply those together are 18. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic is used in encryption to keep things like personal identification numbers and online shopping secure. An overly simplified uh, version of the process says that an electronic message is converted into a number so that computers can talk about it over electronic transmission. Uh, to keep that secret, uh, it's going to be multiplied by some prime number or key that's known only by the sender and the recipient. The new number, the encoded version, is transmitted. The recipient divides that uh, divides by that prime number, the key, to get the message. In practice, uh, prime numbers like uh, 13 or even 97 are not used. Those are, those are much too small. Really, they use some very large prime numbers, those with hundreds or thousands of digits. And the reason why is because it's for a very large number, it's difficult to determine if that number is prime, and that keeps the system more secure. The largest known prime number, um, at least as of recently, has 12,978,189 digits. I'm not saying that that number, 12 million and some, is prime. I'm saying that's how many digits the largest known prime number has. If you were going to print this out, it would take more than 3,000 pages of paper. Uh, to print out, and there is an organization searching for these larger and larger primes. Uh, it's, uh, GIMPS is one version, G-I-M-P-S is an acronym. The M stands for Mersenne, uh, the P stands for primes, and so that's, uh, that's the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search. I'd like for you to determine whether these numbers are prime, and if they're not prime, then write the prime factorization. Uh, for that number. So go ahead and pause this and, and work on here. Some strategies you probably use to determine whether a number was prime to see if it fits a criteria for any known divisibility test, such as is it even, then it's divisible by 2. Uh, do the digits sum to a multiple of 3, then it's a multiple of 3. Um, is the last digit 5 or 0, then it's divisible by 5. Um, another way to check it is just to start testing uh, to see if it's divisible by primes that you know that are less than that number. And why do we just check the prime numbers? Uh, why not all the numbers less than n? Uh, so if we want to determine if 57 is prime, do we need to check if it's divisible by 4 or 6 or 8 or 9? And do we really need to check all the primes less than n? So if we're trying to determine if 57 is prime, do we really need to see if it's divisible by 47 or 43? If a number is divisible by a composite number, then it's also divisible by the prime factors of that composite number. So that's why we just check the primes. 
And really, it, we don't have to check all the primes less than n, but all the primes less than or equal to the square root of n. Uh, that's because half of the factors of a number are less than or equal to the square root, and you can verify that. A couple of class activities that I would do if we were meeting face to face is find all the primes less than a certain number, so less than 50. Uh, one method you may have seen before is the sieve of Eratosthenes that says take the numbers, and I've removed one since it's not a prime number, and circle the first uh, number on the list that's not crossed out here, it's two, and then cross out all the multiples of two because they are not clearly not prime if they're a multiple of two. Then we would circle the next number which is 3, that means that's prime, and cross out all the multiples of 3. Next we circle uh, the next uncrossed number, so that would be 5, and cross off all the multiples of 5. Now the first multiple of 5 I will have to cross off is 25, 5 squared. All the others, uh, 10, 15, and 20, have already been crossed off. For 7, the first, I'll circle 7, and the first thing I will have to cross off, notice I've already got 14, 21, 28, 35, and 42 taken care of. The first one I have to cross off is 49. The next number, uh, prime number, would be 11, and that is already, um, and, and I, the first thing I would have to cross off for 11 is 121. I already have 22, 33, and 44 crossed off. That means all these numbers that are not yet crossed off are prime. So the primes less than 50 are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, 37, 41, 43, and 47. I'd like you to use uh, the sieve of 6, which is a similar uh, similar method, but the numbers are arranged a little bit differently. You can print off the handout and find the primes that are less than 200 using that. If you haven't done that yet, please pause the video and do that now. You should have found 46 prime numbers less than 200. And what you should notice is once we get past the first row, the primes are going to show up either in the column under 1 or the column under the 5. Um, that's because all the numbers under 2 and 4 and 6 are crossed off as multiples of 2, and all the numbers under 3 are crossed off as multiples of 3. So therefore, if p is a number, uh, a prime number, greater than 5, then p is either going to equal uh, 6 times n plus 1, or p is going to equal 6 times n plus 5 for some whole number n. Uh, what that means is we could write the prime number 7 as like 6 times 1 plus 1, or the prime number 11 as 6 times 1 plus 5, or the prime number 43 as 6 times 7 plus 1. We can use this fact to show that if p is a prime number greater than 5, then p squared plus 2 is going to actually be a composite number. Now because p can take on two forms, we need have to examine two cases. Uh, we're going to look here at the case where p equals 6n plus 1. If p equals 6n plus 1 for some natural number n, then p squared plus 2 is 6n plus 1, the quantity squared, plus 2. As we use some algebra and expand this binomial and simplify, uh, we get to the statement where we have 36n squared plus 12n plus 3. We can factor a 3 out of that, uh, which says that we can take p squared plus 2 as 3 times some number. So that means we can divide p squared plus 2 by 3, and therefore it's not prime, it's going to be a multiple of 3 and therefore composite. And I'll let you use case 2 uh, and prove that for your homework.